Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is peripheral nerve tumors and tumor syndromes. I will be uh, comparing and contrasting neurofibromatosis type 1 and 2, as well as discussing the pathophysiology and morphologic features of the peripheral nerve sheath tumors. When we talk about peripheral nerve sheath tumors, we are talking about three entities, schwannoma, neurofibroma, and malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, or MPNSTs. All three of these show uh, Schwann cell differentiation, which is why they're referred to as peripheral nerve sheath tumors. They are not tumors of nerve cells. Uh, they are associated with uh, familial tumor syndromes. So neurofibromatosis type 1, or NF1, is associated with neurofibromas uh, and uh, MPNSTs, and is due to germline mutations in the NF1 gene, which encodes the protein neurofibromin. Neurofibromatosis type 2, or NF2, uh, you would think from the name it too has abundant neurofibromas, but that is not the case. It is characterized instead by uh, multiple schwannomas uh, as well as meningiomas. And in part, because of uh, that uh, particular finding, uh, and because it is more in alignment with schwannomatoses, uh, there's been a recent position paper that has suggested the name be changed from neurofibromatosis type 2 to NF2-related schwannomatosis. Uh, this is still in early days. You will need to know a neurofibromatosis type 2 for your wards and your boards, so that will be the terminology I will retain in this video. NF2 is due to germline mutations in the NF2 gene, which encodes the protein Merlin. So uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 is an autosomal dominant disease with complete penetrance, affecting about 1 in 3,000 individuals. About half of cases are familial and half are sporadic, and they are due to germline mutations in the NF1 gene. So NF1, uh, as I mentioned, encodes the protein neurofibromin, which is a GTPase. It is a tumor suppressor that regulates RAS function, and when we lose our NF1 function, we get constitutive RAS activation with uh, downstream signaling. Now, this is something that we covered in the Hallmarks of Cancer video uh, part one, but let's just do a quick review. Uh, here is a healthy cell where we have our growth factor receptor stimulated by a growth factor, which is going to cause activation of RAS. When RAS is activated, it's going to begin our downstream signaling. However, NF1 is going to hydrolyze this GTP to GDP, thereby abrogating our RAS uh, activity uh, and stopping uh, this process once we've had that one stimulus go through. Now, by contrast, what we will see in neurofibromatosis type 1 is that we've lost our NF1 function, so the GTP is not hydrolyzed. We get constitutive activation without the need uh, for growth factor stimulus. This is going to cause uh, signaling uh, pathways that will result in uh, progrowth genes and cell growth, leading to the tumors that we see in NF1. Now, there are a variety of clinical findings that we see in NF1. Uh, the first of these uh, is often referred to as cafe au lait spots. And these are hyperpigmented macules of the skin. Uh, I believe that the appropriate terminology uh, should be more hyperpigmented macules instead of cafe au lait spots because uh, this uh, refers to coffee with cream and this appearance uh, varies depending on the pigmentation of the patient. We can also see uh, freckling of the axillary and inguinal areas, uh, Lish nodules, which are hamartomas uh, of the eye, which I'll show you in a moment, a variety of uh, skeletal dysplasias, and patients may have seizures uh, or intellectual disability. Let's begin uh, with these hyperpigmented macules. You can see here on the right uh, why the term cafe au lait uh, can seem appropriate based on some patient uh, populations, but in individuals with darker skin, uh, this uh, analogy does not really uh, hold well. Uh, so keep uh, uh, an eye out to recognize that they're hyperpigmented. They don't have this coffee with cream appearance depending on skin uh, pigmentation. Here's an example of a Lish nodule, uh, which is a hamartomatous plaque or nodule of the anterior iris. Uh, you can see it's circumferential and has this brown appearance. They're frequently bilateral and are part of the diagnostic criteria for NF1, which we'll cover uh, in a moment. Now, there are also a variety of tumors associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, neurofibromas are at the top of the list, and there are multiple types of neurofibromas. Uh, I've put uh, here in boldface plexiform because this one is most closely associated with NF1, but we can also see diffuse and cutaneous uh, neurofibromas. Uh, the difference is, is that diffuse and cutaneous neurofibromas can be seen uh, in myriad other conditions, whereas plexiform neurofibromas are very characteristic of NF1. 
We can also see uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors as well as gliomas of the optic nerve and tumors of the adrenal medulla or pheochromocytomas. So let's take a look at the neurofibromas. Uh, so there are three types, as I mentioned. You can have a localized cutaneous neurofibroma, which is a circumscribed but unencapsulated nodule. You can have a plexiform neurofibroma, which is a ropey thickening of multiple nerve fascicles. Uh, grossly, this can have the appearance of a bag of worms. I'll show you an example of that in a moment. And finally, uh, we can have a diffuse neurofibroma, in which we get this uh, expansion of the dermis and subcutaneous soft tissue with Schwannian cells. This leads to this plaque-like appearance. Before we go on to take a look at these, uh, let's reflect on the histology. All of these will have similar histologic findings. They will be uh, composed of an admixture of Schwann cells, mast cells, perineurial cells, spindle cells, and fibroblasts. So this is very different from what we will see in a Schwannoma, in which we only have really uh, one dominant uh, population, the Schwannian cells. We'll also see variable amounts of collagen, which uh, can have this bundled appearance, which is referred to on occasion as looking like shredded carrots. And the stroma may vary from mixoid, which is a bluish-gray gelatinous appearance, to uh, quite fibrous. So let's begin first by looking at our cutaneous neurofibromas. Uh, here you can see them uh, in two different patients. We have these multiple uh, cutaneous nodules. Uh, here there are uh, abundant uh, cutaneous neurofibromas. Now histologically, what we'll see is this uh, lesion in the skin, uh, which uh, does not have a capsule, but it is not invasive. It's well circumscribed. And you can imagine if you cut into there, it'd be very easily to remove this uh, from the uh, patient. We'll look at the histology on higher magnification in a moment. This brings us now to the plexiform neurofibroma. So here's a clinical example. Uh, this is a uh, plexiform neurofibroma that's growing in the soft tissue here of the forehead and the orbit. Uh, now, it's not possible to tell this is a neurofibroma simply by uh, looking at the clinical appearance, but uh, on resection and histologic examination, that was what this patient was found to have. And here's an example of what that gross appearance can look like, this bag of worms where you have this nodular thickening of multiple unnerved fascicles. And then here's just another example where you can see this massive expansion uh, of these deep nerves uh, by a plexiform neurofibroma. Uh, this is an example of a plexiform neurofibroma in the uh, deep dermis uh, extending into the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, and you can appreciate here that unlike that cutaneous neurofibroma that was uh, well circumscribed, this has this branching uh, appearance. This is because our various nerve twigs are all expanded uh, by these Schwannian cells. Let's take a look here at higher magnification, and this is the classic appearance of a neurofibroma, where we have these buckled or wavy Schwannian cells admixed with these uh, collagen bundles looking like shredded carrots. And this one has a fairly mixoid background. You can see this bluish gray uh, material through here. And we're also going to have mast cells and fibroblasts also scattered through here. So how do we make a diagnosis of neurofibromatosis type 1? Uh, it involves uh, identifying two or more of the following. So six or more of our hyperpigmented macules, uh, neurofibromas, uh, two or more of uh, any type, or one plexiform neurofibroma, highlighting the importance of this lesion in this diagnosis, uh, as well as uh, some other features. So how do patients with NF1 do? Uh, they are at increased risk of malignancies. So uh, I've already mentioned malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. We'll touch on that next. But also uh, breast cancer and pheochromocytoma. Patients are also susceptible to hypertension, osteoporosis and scoliosis, as well as cognitive and psychiatric issues. Uh, and they have been found to have a decreased uh, life expectancy. So this brings us to the MPNST, uh, which is very closely associated with NF1. In fact, half of patients who develop an MPNST have NF1. Now, the corollary to this is, of course, not that all patients with NF1 develop an MPNST. It's a very rare tumor. But we see that about 8 to 13% of patients with NF1 will develop an MPNST. And it's presumed uh, that these arise from plexiform neurofibromas. Uh, these tend to be very high-grade tumors, about 85%, and they are aggressive uh, and tend to have a poor prognosis. Uh, they arise uh, from the large peripheral nerves of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, and limb girdle. 
Now, morphologically, uh, the gross examination will show a poorly defined tumor mass. And when we look through the microscope, uh, we will see fascicles of these atypical spindle cells uh, that can actually uh, uh, even adopt an epithelioid appearance. Uh, in cases like this, we will use immunohistochemistry to confirm our diagnosis. Uh, immunohistochemistry is always useful uh, in this condition, unless it is something that is arising in a plexiform neurofibroma that pretty much seals the diagnosis of an MPNST. Because this is a high-grade tumor, we can expect to see necrosis, uh, brisk mitotic activity, and nuclear anaplasia. And one of the interesting uh, things about uh, these uh, neurofibromas and MPNSTs is they may show divergent differentiation with skeletal muscle uh, or glandular differentiation. Now, here is a, a core needle biopsy of an MPNST. Uh, just for comparison, I've put a neurofibroma up next to it. And you can tell immediately uh, that there's, uh, there's some significant differences. We have a very uh, uh, prominent fascicular architecture with the uh, cells aligned uh, in parallel rows. Uh, there's more densely uh, cellular, and there's pleomorphism with some enlarged hyperchromatic cells scattered through. Compare that to this uh, less cellular, uh, haphazardly arranged lesion here. Uh, higher magnification uh, gives us the opportunity to uh, look at the uh, pleomorphism and the hyperchromasia. Uh, this is probably a little mitotic figure right here as well. And this is an example of an epithelioid MPNST, uh, which uh, looks very different from what we just uh, showed. Uh, you can see a mitotic figure here and here. Uh, this is one in which immunohistochemistry would be a very useful uh, adjunct. So this brings us now to uh, neurofibromatosis uh, type 2, which, uh, like NF1, is an autosomal dominant disease, also with complete penetrance, but is much less common, affecting 1 in uh, 40,000 to 50,000 patients. Patients tend to present at 20 to 25 years of age, uh, typically with bilateral vestibular schwannomas. So these are schwannomas of uh, cranial nerve 8. So we see this in 90 to 95% of patients. And this can present as tinnitus and hearing loss. We can also get schwannomas of other nerves, uh, as well as meningiomas, which are covered in a video on CNS tumors. Uh, as you would imagine, uh, the uh, effect on the nerves can lead to neuropathies. And because we are at risk for schwannomas and meningiomas, we can see an uh, effect on the spinal cord, leading to weakness and pain. These patients may also have ocular symptoms, uh, including cataracts. So uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 is due to mutations in the NF2 gene, which affects the protein Merlin, which, like uh, neurofibromin, is a tumor suppressor. It's a cytoskeletal protein that regulates key signaling pathways involved in cell shape, growth, and adhesion. And we see it mutated not only in NF2, but also in sporadic meningiomas and schwannomas. So this gives me the opportunity to turn our attention to schwannomas, which often arise directly uh, from peripheral nerves uh, and may be either familial, for example, a context of NF2, or sporadic. And in both familial and sporadic schwannomas, we see a loss of function of the NF2 uh, protein uh, Merlin. Now, microscopically, we'll see well-circumscribed encapsulated masses uh, that are loosely attached to an associated nerve. We refer to the uh, alternating dense and loose tissue as Antony A and Antony B areas, respectively. And we can see a particular finding referred to as a varicae body in which we have palisaded nuclei, so nuclei that are lined up, uh, that are interspersed with nucleus-free zones. So here is a low-power view of a schwannoma, and you can tell uh, even at this low power it looks very different from our cutaneous neurofibroma. We have this thin capsule uh, that surrounds it, and there's a lot of variation in the appearance here as opposed to that very uniform appearance of the uh, neurofibroma. This slide highlights the Antony A and Antony B areas, as well as you can see these atypical blood vessels. And then this is uh, an image showing uh, the uh, varicae bodies, where you have these uh, palisaded, lined-up nuclei interspersed with areas that uh, have uh, just cellular processes. So how do patients with NF2 do? Uh, because of their vestibular schwannomas, they tend to uh, be at risk for deafness and poor balance, which can lead to falls. Uh, they can have impaired cranial nerve function, leading to difficulties with swallowing and speech. Uh, and because of uh, some of their nerve tumors, they may uh, be uh, wheelchair bound. Uh, this can also be related to difficulty with vision due to uh, cataracts. Uh, and they, uh, like patients with NF1, have a decreased life expectancy, uh, in their case, largely due to their tumors. So this brings us uh, to the end of this video with uh, the questions that I like to provide for you to test your knowledge. 
uh, please do subscribe. Uh, I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.